Vitamin E, estrogen antagonist, energy promoter, and anti-inflammatory. Vitamin E, like progesterone and aspirin, acts within the cellular regulatory systems to prevent inflammation and inappropriate excitation. Since uncontrolled excitation causes destructive oxidations, these substances prevent those forms of oxidation. Molecules that can easily be oxidized and reduced can function as antioxidants, and vitamin E does function as that kind of antioxidant in many chemical environments. But it is highly misleading to consider that as the explanation for its many beneficial biological effects. That kind of reasoning contributed to the use of the antioxidant carcinogens BHT and BHA as food additives and anti-aging supplements, and many other chemicals are being promoted on the basis of their abstract antioxidant function. Becoming aware of the real value of vitamin E will have far-reaching implications in nutrition and medicine. In determining criminal or civil legal responsibility, the concept should have known is recognized and used. In science, which is all about knowing, there is certainly a responsibility to be informed when the subject involves the life and health of millions of people. The science establishment of government and industry should be held responsible for the information it hides, destroys, or ignores for its own benefit. The US government has an agency for prosecuting research fraud, but the concept is applied so narrowly as to be meaningless when deception has become the rule. And since it controls the core system, government agencies and their functionaries won't be prosecuted, even when their crimes become well known. Vitamin E was advocated as an effective treatment for heart disease by Dr. Evan Shute of London, Ontario, more than 50 years ago. His pioneering claims, which were unacceptable to the medical community at large, have been confirmed by recent findings from epidemiologic studies and clinical trials. Political scientists have recognized the process in which big corporations captured the governmental agencies that were created to regulate them. The editorial boards of professional journals can be captured even more cheaply than the agencies of government, and their influence can be even more valuable to industry. If science impinges upon the plans of an industry, it can be managed into compliance when the industry controls the journals and the agencies that fund research. In the 1940s, it had already become clear to the estrogen industry that vitamin E research was impinging on its vital interests. The Manhattan Project, that created the atomic bomb, also created a generation of scientific and bureaucratic zealots who ignored public health and safety to advance their projects and their careers, and changed the way science was done. At exactly the same time, the pharmaceutical industry was using its financial and political power to change the way medicine was practiced and taught, and the consequences for world health rivaled those of the nuclear industry. In 1933 the physician R.J. Shute was aware of the problems associated with toxemia of pregnancy or preeclampsia. Especially among poorly nourished women, many pregnancies were complicated by circulatory problems, including cyclic bleeding, thrombosis, stroke, and hypertension, and these difficult pregnancies often ended in miscarriage or premature delivery, resulting in many serious health problems among the babies that survived. At that time, both estrogen and vitamin E were being widely studied, though the exact structure of the tocopherol molecule wasn't defined until 1936 37. Vitamin E had been found to improve fertility of both male and female animals, and to prevent intrauterine death of the embryo or fetus, so it was called the anti-sterility vitamin. Using it to prevent women from having miscarriages must have occurred to many people. Animal research in the 1930s was also showing that estrogen had many toxic effects, including causing infertility or intrauterine death, connective tissue abnormalities, and excessive blood clotting. Dr. Shute and his sons, Wilfred and Evan, were among those who considered vitamin E to be an anti-estrogen. They found that it was very effective in preventing the clotting diseases of pregnancy. Other researchers, who knew that progesterone protected against the toxic effects of estrogen, described vitamin E as the progesterone sparing agent, since so many of its anti-estrogenic effects resembled those of progesterone. The Shute brothers began using vitamin E to treat circulatory diseases in general, rather than just in pregnant women blood clots, phlebitis, hypertension, heart disease, and diabetes, all responded well to treatment with large doses. Vitamin E, as its name indicates, was the fifth type of vitamin factor to be identified, and it received its name in 1922, even though its chemical structure hadn't been identified. The public quickly understood and accepted that certain substances in food were essential for life and health, so by 1940, practically all physicians were recommending the use of nutritional supplements. The vitamin E was essential for human health, and achieved at least some of its amazing effects by opposing estrogen, then the synthetic estrogen industry had a problem. Edward L. Bernays had already been in business for decades, teaching corporations and governments how to engineer consent. After his work for the government to engineer support for entering the First World War, Bernays' next big job was for the tobacco industry. To convince women to smoke cigarettes, to achieve equality with men, he organized an Easter parade, Torches of Freedom, in which thousands of women marched smoking their freedom torches. 
in association with the American Medical Association. The editor of JAMA actually helped the tobacco industry design its campaigns. Bernays ran a campaign to convince Americans that smoking was good for the health. The drug industry began using his techniques in sometimes crude but always effective ways. Estrogen was named the female hormone. Natural hormones, including estrogen and progesterone, were claimed, without any research, to be inactive when taken orally. Physician shields were created to claim wonderful effects for estrogen. The vitamin status of the tocopherols was denied. As recently as the 1970s, and maybe later, university professors of dietetics were flatly saying, no one needs vitamin E. Very little research showing the curative effects of vitamin E in human diseases was allowed to be published, so it was only occasionally necessary to openly denounce vitamin E as worthless or dangerous. In 1981, the Journal of the AMA published an article reviewing the toxic effects of vitamin E. Since I had read all of the articles cited, I realized that the author was claiming that whenever vitamin E changed something, the change was harmful. Even though the original publication had described the effect as beneficial. Although JAMA was eventually forced to give up its revenue from cigarette advertising, it didn't suffer at all because of the vast advertising campaigns of the estrogen industry. JAMA obviously wouldn't want to publish anything suggesting that vitamin E or progesterone or thyroid might be beneficial because of its antagonism of the harmful effects of estrogen. Estrogen causes changes in the uterus that prevent implantation of the embryo and that impair support for its development if it is already implanted. It decreases the availability of oxygen to the embryo while vitamin E increases it. My dissertation advisor, A.L. Soderwall, did a series of experiments in which he showed that providing hamsters with extra vitamin E postponed the onset of infertility in middle age. In my experiments, vitamin E increased the amount of oxygen in the uterus, correcting an oxygen deficiency produced either by supplemental estrogen or by old age. Progesterone has similar effects on the delivery of oxygen to the uterus. In the 1940s, the official definition of vitamin E's activity was changed. Instead of its effectiveness in preventing the death and resorption of embryos or the degeneration of the testicles or brain or muscles, it was redefined as an antioxidant, preventing the oxidation of unsaturated oils. Although some people continue to think of it as a protective factor against thrombosis, heart attacks, diabetes, and infertility, the medical establishment claimed that the prevention or cure of diseases in animals wasn't relevant to humans, and that a mere antioxidant couldn't prevent or cure any human disease. The experiments that led to the identification of vitamin E involved feeding rats a diet containing rancid lard and, as a vitamin A supplement, cod liver oil. Both of these contained large amounts of polyunsaturated oils. From 1929 to the early 1930s, other researchers were claiming to have demonstrated that the polyunsaturated fatty acids were nutritionally essential. These experiments, like the vitamin E experiments, were done on rats, but the medical establishment was satisfied that rat experiments proved that humans need linoleic or linolenic acid, while they refused to accept that vitamin E was essential for humans. When, in the 1940s, a group of vitamin B6 researchers showed that the supposed essential fatty acid deficiency could be cured by a supplement of vitamin B6, it became apparent that the polyunsaturated fatty acids slowed metabolism and reduced all nutritional needs. The thyroid hormone was powerfully suppressed by the essential fatty acids. When we consider the two sets of experiments together, their outstanding feature is the toxicity of the polyunsaturated oils, which in one kind of experiment suppressed metabolism, and in the other kind of experiment, created a variety of degenerative conditions. By the late 1940s and early 1950s, estrogens of various sorts had been synthesized from hydrocarbons, and were being recommended to prevent miscarriages, because estrogen is the female hormone. The meat industry had found that the polyunsaturated oils were valuable in animal feed, since they suppressed metabolism and made it cheaper to fatten the animals, and these antithyroid oils were next marketed as heart-protective human foods. Though by suppressing the thyroid and destroying vitamin E, they actually contributed to both heart disease and cancer. Giving estrogen to livestock to improve their feed efficiency and to people to prevent heart attacks was an interesting parallel to the oil promotional campaigns. The influence of the food oil industry kept researchers away from the idea that these oils were not safe for food use, and instead tended to support the idea that vitamin E is just an antioxidant, and that the seed oils were the best way to get vitamin E in the diet. The anti-fertility effects of the polyunsaturated oils, demonstrated in the vitamin E experiments, weren't at the time understood to have anything to do with estrogen's anti-fertility effects. But to understand vitamin E, I think we have to consider the close interactions between estrogen and the polyunsaturated fatty acids, PUFA. Their actions are closely intertwined and are antagonized by a variety of energizing and stabilizing substances, including saturated fats, progesterone, thyroid, vitamin E, and aspirin. Generally, chemicals that inhibit enzymes are toxic, producing some sort of symptom or deterioration. But a group of enzymes related to estrogen and PUFA are inhibited by these protective substances. 
Although under our present diet, these enzymes metabolize the PUFA, in the fetus and newborn they act on our endogenous fats, the series related to the meat acids. The meat acid is anti-inflammatory and broadly protective. The dietary PUFA interfere with these natural protective substances. The enzymes that, if we didn't eat PUFA, would be regulating the meat series, being activated in response to stress, would be producing anti-stress substances, which would limit the stress reaction. But as we become increasingly saturated with the anti-vitamin E fats, these enzymes, instead of stopping inflammation, promote it and cause tissue injury. The remaining stress-limiting factors, such as progesterone, by correcting the distortions caused by stress, tend to eliminate the conditions which activated the enzymes in a very indirect form of inhibition. Many of the events involved in inflammation are increased by estrogen, and decreased by vitamin E estrogen causes capillaries to become leaky, vitamin E does the opposite. Estrogen increases platelet aggregation, and decreases a factor that inhibits platelet aggregation, vitamin E does the opposite. Excess clotting is known to be caused by too much estrogen, and also by a vitamin E deficiency. Clotting leads to fibrosis, and there is clear evidence that vitamin E prevents and cures fibrotic diseases, but this still isn't generally accepted by the powerful medical institutions. Estrogen and polyunsaturated fats increase fibrosis. Estrogen increases proxaglandin synthesis, vitamin E decreases their synthesis. Estrogen increases the activity of the enzymes COX and LOX, vitamin E decreases their activity. Estrogen releases enzymes from lysosomes, vitamin E inhibits their release. Beta-glucuronidase, one of these enzymes, can release estrogen at the site of an inflammation. Estrogen often increases intracellular calcium and protein kinase C, vitamin E has generally opposite effects. The polyunsaturated fatty acids and their derivatives, the prostaglandins, act as effectors or amplifiers of estrogen's actions. The vitamin E is acting as a protectant against the polyunsaturated fatty acids, that in itself would account for at least some of its antiestrogenic effects. Besides antagonizing some of the end effects of the toxic fatty acids, vitamin E inhibits lipolysis, lowering the concentration of free fatty acids, the opposite of estrogen's effect, and it also binds to, and inactivates, free fatty acids. The long saturated carbon chain is very important for its full functioning, and this saturated chain might allow it to serve as a substitute for the omega-9 fats, from which the meat acid is formed. The unsaturated tocotrienols have hardly been tested for the spectrum of true vitamin E activity, and animal studies have suggested that it may be toxic, since it caused liver enlargement. One possibly crucial protective effect of vitamin E against the polyunsaturated fatty acids that hasn't been explored, is the direct destruction of linolenic and linoleic acid. It is known that bacterial vitamin E is involved in the saturation of unsaturated fatty acids, and it is also known that intestinal bacteria turn linoleic and linolenic acids into the fully saturated stearic acid. No metabolic function is known for alpha tocopherylquinol or its quinin, other than as a cofactor in the biohydrogenation of unsaturated fatty acids, that can be carried out by only a few organisms. P. Hughes and S. B. Tove, 1982. Linoleic acid was significantly decreased, P0.001, and there was a significant rise, P0.05, in its hydrogenation product, stearic acid. Linolenic acid was also significantly decreased. Dot dot dot. The study provides evidence that bacteria from the human colon can hydrogenate C18 essential polyunsaturated fatty acids. F. A. Howard and C. Henderson, 1999. Because of the way in which the decision to call vitamin E a simple antioxidant was conditioned by the historical setting, there has been a reluctance, until recently, to give much weight to the pathogenicity of lipid peroxidation in free radicals. Partly because lipid peroxidation is only a minor part of the toxicity of the polyunsaturated oils, and there was little support for the investigation of the real nature of their toxicity. This environment has even distorted the actual antioxidant value of the various forms of vitamin E. For example, C. Chen, et al., 2002. The people who say that vitamin E is nothing but an antioxidant, sometimes take other antioxidants, with, or instead of, vitamin E BHT, BHA, and many natural compounds, derived from industrial and agricultural wastes, are often said to be better than vitamin E as antioxidants. Anything that can be oxidized and reduced, melatonin, estrogen, tryptophan, carotene, etc., will function as an antioxidant in some system, but in other circumstances, it can be a prooxidant. The people who think there is benefit in the abstract antioxidant function seem to be thinking in terms of something that will, like a ubiquitous fire department, put out every little fire as soon as it starts. I think it's more appropriate to think of the biological antioxidant systems as programs for controlling the arsonists before they can set the fires. Since the requirement for vitamin E decreases as the consumption of unsaturated fats decreases, the requirement, if any, would be very small if we didn't eat significant quantities of those fats.
in the years since the tocopherols were identified as vitamin E, the material sold for research and for use as a nutritional supplement has changed drastically several times, even when it has been given a specific chemical identity, such as mixed tocopherols or D-alpha tocopherol. Variations in viscosity and color, caused by changes in the impurities, have undoubtedly influenced its biological effects, but the ideology about its antioxidant value has kept researchers from finding out what a particular batch of it really is, and what it really does. We compared the effect of a mixed tocopherol preparation with that of alpha tocopherol alone on superoxide dismutis, SOD, activity, and ENO's expression in cultured myocytes exposed to HR. Both tocopherol preparations attenuated cell injury. Dot dot dot. However, mixed tocopherol preparation was much superior to alpha tocopherol in terms of myocyte protection. Dot 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 lack of efficacy of commercial tocopherol preparations in clinical trials may reflect absence of gamma and delta tocopherols. Gen H, Li D, Seldine T, Romeo F, Meta J L Biochem Biofis Res Common 2002, mixed tocopherol preparation is superior to alpha tocopherol alone against hypoxia reoxygenation injury. Keeping our diet as free as possible of the polyunsaturated fats, to create something like the deficiency state that is so protective, against cancer, trauma, poison, shock, inflammation, infection, etc. In the animal experiments, seems preferable to trying to saturate ourselves with antioxidants, considering the imperfectly defined nature of the vitamin E products, and the known toxicity of many of the other antioxidants on the market. The carcinogenic properties of the polyunsaturated fats have been known for more than 50 years, as has the principle of extending the lifespan by restricted feeding. More recently several studies have demonstrated that the long-lived species contain fewer highly unsaturated fats than the short-lived species. Restriction of calories prevents the lipids in the brain, heart, and liver from becoming more unsaturated with aging. Lee, et al., 1999, Leganier, et al., 1993, Tacconi, et al., 1991, Arpatzel Winchler, 1981. When cells are grown in tissue culture without the essential fatty acids they become deficient, and in that state are very resistant to chemical injury, and can be grown indefinitely. Besides being a simple demonstration of the way in which the polyunsaturated fat sensitize cells to injury, Wei, et al., 1993, these experiments must be an embarrassment to the people who base their argument for the oil's essentiality on a supposed requirement for making cell membranes. Since the cells can multiply nicely in their deficient state, we have to conclude that the oils aren't needed for membranes, or maybe that cells resist injury better without membranes. In the opposite direction, an excess of insulin or prolactin, or a deficiency of vitamin E, increases the activity of the enzymes that convert linoleic acid into the more highly unsaturated fatty acids. Excess insulin and prolactin are crucially involved in many degenerative diseases. The highly unsaturated fats suppress respiration in many ways, and these trends toward increased unsaturation with aging, endocrine stress, and vitamin E deficiency, parallel the lifelong trend toward lower energy production from respiration. Many studies show that vitamin E can protect and improve mitochondrial energy production. Kikuchi, et al., 1991, Donchenko, et al., 1990, 1983, Gordieri, et al., 1981, 1982. But the state of so-called essential fatty acid deficiency not only makes mitochondria very resistant to injury, it greatly intensifies their energy production. Vitamin E supplementation is seldom as effective as the absence of the toxic oils. Many nutrition charts no longer list liver as a good source of vitamin E, but a large portion of an animal's vitamin E is in its liver. This bias in the dietetic literature can be traced to various sources, but a major influence was the campaign in the 1970s by the drug companies that had patented new forms of synthetic vitamin A. They had physicians and professors fabricate stories about the great toxicity of natural vitamin A and place the stories in national magazines to clear the field for their supposedly non-toxic products, which have turned out to be disastrously toxic. The result is that many people have fearfully stopped eating liver because of its vitamin A. The other vitamins in liver, including vitamin K, function very closely with vitamin E, and the stably stored forms of vitamin E are likely to be a good approximation for our needs. There is still a strong division between what people can say in their professional publications and what they believe. A man who was influential in designating vitamin E as an antioxidant, M.K. Poet, complained when the government raised its recommended vitamin E intake by 50% because it wasn't supported by new data and because millions of people get only 10 mg per day and are healthy. But he has been taking 200 mg daily, plus aspirin, for many years. He apparently doesn't have very much confidence in the ideas he advocates publicly, 